high. So, what did that video make you feel like? Uncomfortable? Like Tyra's lost her damn mind? What the hell was that? I thought I was coming to the Upfront Summit to get some knowledge on how to take my VC to the XYZ, right? Tonight, or today, shall I say, I want to talk about pain. And I want everybody to think about their own pain. Because a lot of that pain, a lot of that people telling you that you can't do something, that you're not good enough, oh, that'll never happen, not to you, maybe to them, but not to you. That pain leads to passion, passion. And then after that passion and that obsession and that, oh my gosh, I have to do this, I need to make this change, I need to innovate this, comes a plan. So we're gonna talk about pain, passion, leading to a plan. And we're gonna go back in time. We're gonna go back in time right now before cell phones, before texting, before all of the beautiful technology. And we're gonna go back to 19, I think it's 89. I was 15 years old and it was the first day of school. And actually I was 13, it was the first day of school. And a girl came up to me and she said, Ayamara? Ayamara? I was like, what? Ayamara! And then I finally put together what she was trying to say with her lack of tongue which is, I guess you guys can hear that, are you a model? And I was awkward. Actually, I've got my years all wrong. What is, I think it was 87, first day of high school. And this girl became my best friend. And she mentored me and she coached me in how to be the fiercest me in front of a camera. She became a professional model in 10th grade. And then two years later, I said, okay, I'm gonna try this. After my mother photographing me and on our back porch, on the train tracks here in Los Angeles, downtown, kind of like, you know, stepping over needles and things like that to get the best shot, I finally had five pictures in my portfolio and I took it to different modeling agencies here in Los Angeles. The first one said, you know what? We already have a black girl. And I looked at the screen, almost like the wall, probably the size of this big ass picture of me with this pink hair, and it was full of little tiny cards, five by seven cards of models' faces. And there was one speck of chocolate on that board. I heard that again and again and again. Until finally the sixth agency said, yes, we're gonna take a chance on you. We don't think you're that photogenic, but we think that you can work a runway. And I said yes. And so those last years of high school, I modeled after school and on weekends, was really happy to be in that Macy's catalog, Sunday newspaper, you guys know what I'm talking about? Um, but my real dream and goal was to produce TV and film. I wanted to write and I wanted to produce. So when it was time to put in those college essays and do the SATs and the, SA and the, um, and the ACTs, I put everything into it and got into every single college that I wanted to go to. I ended up saying, okay, I want to go to Loyola Marymount University. USC accepted me, but they accepted me not in the film school. And I was like, I don't want to wait. I want to go to film school now. So I said, okay, Loyola Marymount, here I come. Two weeks before the first day of school, a modeling agent from France came to my Los, my Los Angeles agency and looked at that one little speck of chocolate on the board and said, or the second speck of chocolate actually, right? No, it's count right. And said, I want that girl, I want these girls to be the one that I'm going to bring back to Paris with me, or something like that. 
Sometimes my French accent turns into a little bit of Nigerian. Um, so forgive me. If anybody is Nigerian, I apologize. Um, and so I had a decision to make. I was like, do I go to Paris or do I go to college? Modeling chose me, but I chose school. But which path was I going to take? So I went to my mom. I'm like, mom, what should I do? Should I choose Paris? Should I choose college? What should I do? What should I do? And my mom said, it's up to you. Now, usually as a teenager, you, you know, you want that it's up to you. You want to be in control of the choices that you make for your life. But this was not something that was exciting to me. And I was like, OK, Ma, I think I'm going to choose Paris because the school said that they'll hold my slot for one year. And they'll give me a French credits if I can come back and take a French pro proficiency like test or something. So I'm going to choose Paris. I was like, OK, I got to go. I got to get ready. Mom was like, uh, uh, uh. Your ass studied for the SATs. You studied for the ACTs. You wrote college essays. And you got into every single one of those schools. So I am not putting your ass, my mom likes that word, and it's going to come back later. I'm not putting your ass on a plane until you study Paris like you studied for college. So here we go. Back, back, back. No Google. Who's younger than 30 in the room? Raise your hand. All right, so there's this thing. And it was like this really big, heavy, like yellow book. And you had to like open it and turn pages and find phone numbers and addresses and stuff. It was called the Yellow Pages. Mm -hmm. So I opened the Yellow Pages, and I found Fashion Library. There's actually a Fashion Library. And I went to that librarian in downtown Los Angeles, and I said, my mama says I need to know Paris, and I can't get on the plane to go to Paris unless I know fashion. So that librarian sat with me. She pulled every single French magazine, French L, French Vogue, Marie Claire, Jeune et Jolie, Vingt Ans, all of these magazines, and taught me not to read a magazine like this, but to read it sideways. Because sideways back in the day was where all the credits were in that gutter. Remember that back in the day? Now the creators get the credit, but back then you had to like kind of split it open and kind of break open that seam to kind of see in there. Then we started studying fashion shows. And she was like, this is Chanel, this is Dior, this is Yves Saint Laurent, this is this, 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 this. And I noticed that people walked a little differently for Chanel, really sweet and happy. And they walked very elegant and chic for Yves Saint Laurent. And then Dior was something in between. And I studied about 40 to 50 different fashion designers. I got on that plane to Paris, terrified as hell, and would have about 50 teen auditions every day that I had to go to. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was, this librarian was in my head, so I'm like, okay, I gotta go see Chanel. So, okay, Chanel, crazy hair, big pearls. I actually had pearls in my backpack, my high school backpack that was on my back in Paris. Pulled those pearls out, threw it on my neck, made my hair like this, put on some light lipstick, and walked like this for Karl Lagerfeld, booked. Next. Yves Saint Laurent, OK, they like the hair slicked back in a bun and some red lips. OK, we pull some of this red lipstick out, put my hair in a bun. In the alley, by the way, in France, in Paris, in the alley, walked for Yves Saint Laurent, booked. Got 25 fashion shows booked. The top highest ever, never happened, and hasn't happened since. It was because of the, the plan. <laughs> the plan. Right? Of course, there's the luck and there's all of that. But child, believe me, there are a lot cuter chicks than that was me back in the day. But it was the plan. Cut two years later, and that desire and that passion for me to produce television was burning brighter than ever. Yeah, I was a supermodel, and yeah, I, you know, we had a lot of success. But the TV was burning bright, but I continued to put it aside. One day in Italy, my mother was with me. And she had just had a meeting with my agent. And my agent told her that Tyra's butt is getting so big that she can't do these eight fashion shows in Italy. And these are household names that you guys know. These designers do not want her in their fashion show because her butt is getting too big. You need to go back to the pensione, which is like a hostel in Italy and tell her that she needs to lose weight. My mother comes to me, and she tells me that. And I just started boohooing and crying and trying to figure out what? A plan. 
I was thinking about counting calories. I was like, okay, I can work out in the morning. I can work out at night. I can skip this meal. I can do this. I can do this. Crying in my mother's arms. And my mother said, you know what we're going to do? And I was like, what, mama? What are we going to do? What are we going to do, mama? What are we going to do? We're going to eat pizza. Pizza. My mother took me to a pizzeria on Corso Magenta in Milano, Italy. She set me down. And you guys know in restaurants how there is the table, and the table has paper on it, oftentimes, right? It's like the paper, uh, paper, what do you call that? Tablecloth. She put a pin in my hand, and my mother said, you write down every client in this fashion industry that likes ass. Who likes ass? And I'm not talking about rubbing your ass. I'm not talking about licking your ass. I'm talking about hiring your thick ass. Because my baby has gained weight, my baby is beautiful, and I'll be damned if she starves for these bitches in black. That's what she said. Everybody in the fashion industry used to wear black. They all used to wear black and they used to look very angry. So they used to call them the, the B.O.B.s, the bitches in black. So there's pizza in one hand, pen in the other hand, tears streaming down that paper, and I am shaking and writing down clients. I'm like, who likes ass? Um, Victoria's Secret? Write it down. OK. Sports Illustrated? Write it down. So I had that list of clients, about seven clients. Then she said, OK, now on this column, on the other side of the cheese grease, write down models that have an ass. Who has an ass? I was like, Mom, everybody has an ass. No, a big ass. Big in this world, because it's still a little ass, but compared to these other skinny bitches, who's got a big ass? Cindy Crawford? Write her ass down. So I had clients on this side, ass models on this side. And my mother said, these are the future people that you're working for? and these are the careers that you're going to emulate. And I said, but mama, they're white. And she says, exactly. And what we didn't realize is we were finding the white space because there had never been a black girl that was that girl next door in a bikini that was just Americana. Black models were on the runway, shredding and exotic and absolutely gorgeous, but it was this intimidating, beautiful, high fashion. Not someone that you'd want to just maybe hang on your wall and be like, oh, one day, dude, right? <laughs> so what we had was lots of soaked, gross paper, but on the top of that tablecloth, where nothing was touching, no grease, no pen, white space. And I don't have that much time, so I will save a lot of that journey to get there, but I was the first black woman on the cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, then did it again the next year, and then did it again last year, child. Yes. <laughs> um, Victoria's Secret, first black model to have a Victoria's Secret contract, first black model to be a Victoria's Secret angel, first black model to be on the cover of the catalog, first black model to wear the diamond bra, first black model to wear the diamond bra twice. That became a 10-year contract, and it started with the pain, and then the passion, and then the plan. So the beginning of my career was all about me, me, me. How many covers of magazines can I get? How many campaigns can I get? How many firsts can I accomplish to whack down that so that people behind me can just walk through without the cuts and the scrapes? But then that TV thing came back. That passion to be a television producer just would not go away. And one day, I was standing in my kitchen with some very unattractive underwear on. It was not a Victoria's Secret moment, believe me. It's like period panties for the women that understand, right? And I'm looking out the window, and something hit me. As I'm making my tea, I'm like, wow, there's this new TV show where they're like singing, and there's some mean man, like, like, be real mean to him, and there's like a black man that keeps saying dog, 
and there's some girl named Kelly Clarkon or something like that, and she's like doing really good right now, and there was some guy with curly hair named Justin Wawini, and that was really interesting, but never really got to see what they did when they weren't on that stage. At the same time, there was a show that was on for a while called The Real World. And you got to see them live together and fight for their, for their passions and their causes and everything. And I said, what if I combine that TV show about music, but then have them live in a house like the real world and set it in the modeling industry? I brought it to my agent at the time. And I have one of my beautiful former agents in the room today, and it was not her. Her initials are NJ, it was not her. She was amazing, by the way. She's in his room right now. But it was an agent way before her. I told him this idea, and he said, models are vapid, unsympathetic characters, and no one will want to watch that television show. So I ended up calling my best friend, going around my agent, and pitching it without the agent. And America's Next Top Model has had 24 cycles. It is in 180 countries dubbed, and has had 40 international versions. 40 international versions. But America's Next Top Model is about them, right? Them giving a very small amount of people an opportunity at a career that they never would have thought possible based on socioeconomic status. Maybe they're in the ghetto, don't see a way out. Maybe they live in a trailer park and feel like, I cannot get out of here. But the real reason I created America's Next Top Model wasn't just about giving opportunity. It wasn't just about saying, oh, this is how you smize, and this is how you walk, and this is how you strut, and this is catalog couture, and uh. That was the fun, and that was the candy. But I like to say that America's Next Top Model was a Flintstone vitamin. Again, taking us back to the Yellow Pages. Whoever had a Flintstone vitamin? Okay. And didn't your mom and daddy have to put it on the high shelf because it tasted so damn good? Right? And if they would have let it loose, you would have been ODing and shaking on the floor like you had the mange. Right? America's Next Top Model, Flintstone vitamin. Fun, candy, tasty. But there are things in there that are good for you that are obscured. What me and my Chinese-American partner did on America's Next Top Model is we did laser-focused casting. We said, we know that there are African-American girls with chocolate skin, with very short hair, with broad features that look in the mirror and the world does not tell them they're beautiful because they do not see a reflection of themselves. So we're going to cast a girl like that almost every single cycle. We know that there are redhead girls with alabaster skin, with freckles all over their face and body and legs and feet, and she feels unattractive. So we're going to make sure we cast that. There are girls that are autistic, that are being told that they can't do this and they'll never be able to do that and that they're not beautiful on the inside or the outside based on these challenges that they have. We're going to cast that. And the list was on and on and on. Beginning of my career, me, me, me. America's Next Top Model, them, them, them. Only a select few got to experience America's Next Top Model firsthand while millions got to look on from their television sets and later from their phones. And I didn't feel that was fair. So my pain, being told I wasn't good enough, led to my passion to fight, not just for myself but to others, led to the plan, Model Land. I have been working for 10 years, over 10 years actually, someone reminded me here tonight, on Model Land, a place that everyone can come to and be the ultimate fantasy versions of themselves. Earlier, I was listening to J.J. Abram speak, and he was talking about not seeing a reflection of yourself in that boardroom and what that does to you and what that feels like and what we need to do about that. That's what I feel when it comes to beauty, body, and self-esteem. For at first women, but now I've extended it to men as well because there's issues prevalent there as well based on new research. Model Land is the ultimate place where you can be the fantasy versions of the, yourself. It is story-based. So if you think about Harry Potter, everybody knows Harry Potter? Magical modeling school. 
Model Land is Harry Potter meets America's Next Top Model, pretty much, or modeling. Our heroine is Tukey de la Creme, and when you come to Model Land, Tukey leads an uprising journey where she is encouraging everyone to live their best, most beautiful selves on the inside and out. She's created a revolution called the uprising, where we say, down with cookie cutter beauty, up with uniqueness. So, Model Land is an attraction in Santa Monica, California, steps from the pier. We're 21,000 square feet. We are runways, we are photo shoots, we are fashion, we are beauty, we are shopping, we are theater. We have dancers, we have actors, and we have the most immersive retail you have ever seen. And I don't mean to insult anybody in this room that thinks they're doing immersive retail. Come to Model Land and you will see that you are not. <laughs> Model Land is a ticketed journey where you come and you become part of the uprising. Mom, dad, kids, cousins, sisters, date night. And you go on this journey of fighting beauty standards, but also upping your photo game. There are tips and tricks from me. There are immersive photographic elements created by me and my America's Next Top Model team, and so much more. That's the general admission. Then there's something called the fantasine. I love making up a word. So the fantasine is your fantasy scene, S-C-E-N-E. -E. Le fantasine, uh, like French. This is where you get a ticket and you become transformed. Hair, makeup, styling. And I'm not talking about being the most sexy version of yourself. I'm talking about the Met Ball meets Italian Vogue. When you go to a spa, how many people go to a spa, drop a couple of hundred dollars, beautiful space, they rub you and you feel like, oh, that's wonderful, I feel great. But imagine if you went to a place that looked like a spa on Vegas steroids, someone greeted you with champagne and macaroons and truffles and sat next to you as a smize reader and looked into your eyes and said, what do you wish you could have ever been? because we're gonna make you that today. And then you go into a hair chair and a makeup chair, and that stylist puts those clothes on you, and then you get photographed by some of my photographic team. You don't just leave feeling beautiful on the inside and relaxed like you do at a spa. You got souvenirs. And as the world knows, if you didn't take a picture of it, it didn't happen. And the great thing about Model Land is no matter what you look like, we see beauty in you, even if you don't. And when you leave, we will hopefully have spread some of the love and beauty that we see into you, because we believe that beauty is in the smize of the beholder. Our first location, as I said, is in Santa Monica. We are looking at different locations. We have cleared the trademark for Model Land in Los, I'm sorry, in um, France. England, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, Australia, and Dubai. Did I say all of them? Yes. I look forward to seeing you all at Model Land. Thank you so much. <laughs>